I got really interested in the idea of shock and its use as a political tool when I was in Iraq uh, covering the occupation because there was this almost uh, triple storm of shock going on in that country. There was the first shock, which was the shock and awe invasion, which was followed immediately after by economic shock therapy, more radical than had been attempted even in the former Soviet Union, just a complete overhaul of the economy overnight. That's at least what was attempted. And then there was this third shock, which came into play after people started resisting the occupation and those other two shocks, and that was the shock of torture. And I became interested in why it was that the architects of the invasion and occupation of Iraq had chosen this as their metaphor. What was it about the idea of shock that was so appealing to the people who wanted to remake Iraq? Uh, and I started to actually try to go back to the source of the metaphor of, of shock therapy. So I started reading about its use in psychiatric contexts and also its use in torture. And that um, led me to a really close reading of the declassified CIA interrogation manuals that were first published in 1963 and, and in, um, in the 80s, reprinted and have since been declassified. And looking at how the CIA talks about the importance of putting prisoners into a state of shock, because when they're in a state of shock, they're not able to protect their interests. They become childlike and regressed. The interrogation manuals are really obsessed with this idea of regression. So I started to think about how that had been applied on a mass scale. The exploitation of crisis and shock has very consciously been used by radical free marketeers. And you know, I start the book quoting Milton Friedman, it's something he wrote in 1982, only a crisis, real or perceived, produces real change. And he was admitting that his ideas, his vision of a radical privatized world couldn't be imposed in the absence of a crisis. He was referring to economic crises and economic crises have played that role of sort of softening the ground for the imposition of shock therapy. The Asian economic crisis was a classic example. The so-called tequila crisis in Mexico was another one that unleashed a wave of privatizations in Mexico. But as people become more resistant and more aware of these strategies, and you see these mass mobilizations against the institutions that exploited shock, like the International Monetary Fund, 
Then what starts to happen is the shocks need to get bigger in order for the disorientation to be greater. And that's where you have what I call disaster capitalism. What the Bush administration did after September 11th, when the war on terror was declared, is they essentially launched a new economy. Because the parameters of this economy were, were extraordinarily wide. This is an endless war, we were told. The, the enemy could not be reasoned with. There could be no diplomacy. There could be no discussion. There could only be attack. And that it would not end until evil was defeated everywhere. Right? So if, if you think of it as a business plan, it could hardly be more profitable. Because basically what you're saying is we've got this new market. It's never going to end. And we have unlimited funds to finance this. So unlike a one-off war, what they were building was a permanent new part of the economy, a privatized security state. One other thing Milton Friedman said is that after the crisis hits, the kind of change will depend on the ideas that are lying around. And that's really what the University of Chicago Economics Department was producing all of those years, were ideas that would be lying around when the next crisis hit, being prepared for that crisis. It's not a question of some vast conspiracy that these crises are being deliberately planned and created so that they can be exploited. Now, certainly there are some cases of deliberate shocks that were then exploited, like the book starts with the coup in Chile, which was obviously a planned attack that put a country into shock and then was exploited for the first classic case of economic shock therapy. The war in Iraq was of course planned as well and planned to be as shocking as possible, called shock and awe, so that it could be exploited. But I think in most cases, it's not about planning the original shock, it's about being in an acute state of intellectual disaster preparedness, so that when the crisis hits, you're the ones who are ready with the ideas that are lying around. And so that's what happened when the levees broke, is that the Heritage Foundation was ready with their 32 free market solutions for Hurricane Katrina. And the first one was roll back labor standards. The next one was school vouchers instead of public school funding, and on and on. So they were ready to go. And it's easy to be ready when you have the same ideas, no matter what the crisis is. Before I did this research, I accepted, like most people, a large part of the narrative that the, the, the triumph of the free market uh, around the world in the 80s and 90s was a largely peaceful process. And that in fact, you know, even though we progressives don't admit that there is no alternative, we lost faith in our alternatives and we accepted this narrative that there was a great battle of ideas and that we lost that battle, that we lost that battle. When we look back and we look at key chapters where this free market ideology has had its leaps forward, like the coup in Chile, then the, the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the breaking apart of the Soviet Union, um, Poland in 1989, Tiananmen Square in 1989, and looking at these key junctures where you had these big leaps forward for Milton Friedman's ideology. And what you see at these moments is that it actually never was chosen. And the fact that we can, we can look and say, okay, well, what did Polish voters vote for in 1989? They voted for a party that was promising not to privatize their state companies, but to turn them into workers' co-ops. And what did South Africans vote for in 1994? They voted for a party that was promising to take the rich resources of that country that was in the hands of a tiny elite and redistribute them. What did Russians want in 1993? Most of them believe that privatization should also be done through worker ownership. And these ideas were blasted out of the way through various forms of shock and violence. But it wasn't that we didn't have the ideas, and it wasn't that we ever consented. It wasn't that we were ever convinced of the rightness. We just succumbed at various points. And I actually think that's quite empowering to realize that we didn't lose this battle of ideas, because I think that a lot of what weakens us on the left is this notion that is repeated again and again that our ideas have tried and failed, that they're discredited. And that, I think, keeps us from having the strength of our conviction in key moments. So that's part of the reason why I, I wrote the, the book to say it was actually, it wasn't a battle of ideas, it was a real battle. It was a real war with real casualties. We came up against brutal forces and we lost, but we didn't lose the argument.